Catholics tend to think of the last things as death and judgment, heaven and hell. But there's more, much more. Welcome to The Last Things in Time and Eternity. In this series, Colin Donovan and Desmond Birch will be speaking about the area of theology called eschatology, which concerns not just the fate of individuals and the world, but the presence of the kingdom of God in all of its forms, both in the here and now and in eternity. Here are Colin Donovan and Desmond Birch. Well, welcome back to our series on eschatology, the theology of the eschaton or the kingdom. And I'm here with Desmond Birch. Uh, good to have you back, Des. Thanks, Colin. It's good to be back. And I think we're, uh, we're sort of getting into some of the uh, really uh, controversies now in terms of eschatology, as, as we remarked earlier in the series. Uh, this is not a subject that has been dealt with uh, really in, in many centuries for the most part. Uh, and it's returning to discussion through scripture studies and, uh, and, and so on in our time. Uh, but it's not always getting a uh, presentation consistent with the sacred tradition. And the area we're going to talk about today is, is sort of foundational for understanding uh, the, the events of the end times or the events yes. leading up to the eschaton. And it deals with uh, sort of the question, to, to frame it in a journalistic style, what did Christ know and when yeah. did he know it? <laughs> because yeah. we're relying on, on, the, on our Lord himself and what he has to say in the Gospels uh, regarding the end times, are we not? Uh, yes, we are. And the bottom line is, if he, didn't, if he didn't know what he was talking about, then there is no subject of eschatology, and you and I are sitting here wasting our time, and so is the church, which has taught the subject of eschatology for thousands of years. That's right. Now, we need to do, before we get into some of the specific points, uh, to demonstrate that Christ uh, always knew who he was and therefore was a uh, authentic source of information regarding the end times and the, yes. the events of the end times and so on. We need to say a little bit about the common theology on, uh, from what's called Christology, the theology of Christ itself. And uh, basically that is that Christ was a divine person, not a human person, and therefore as a person, as a uh, not a perfectly accurate term with respect to Christ, but by comparison to, to us human beings, as a consciousness of who he was, he had that from all eternity as the yes. eternal word. And that at a point of time, the incarnation, he united to his divine personhood and his divine nature, right. uh, which he shares with the Father and the Holy Spirit, a human nature. Yes. So that at the very instant of his conception in the womb of Our Lady, by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, he was in that instant both God and man, but a divine person, and he was never a human person. Right. So that when we talk about the knowledge of God, we must uh, the knowledge of Christ in his humanity, we must always have this starting point that he was a divine person and not a human person who was dependent alone on the sense knowledge which we all acquire as we develop in life and we go through life. Uh, yes, uh, Pope Leo the Great defined this term, this personhood of Christ, by redefining the word persona in the middle of the uh, fifth century in a document that he sent to the Council of the Fathers of the Council of Chalcedon to define this doctrine. Up until that time, persona meant a mask used in drama. Both the word was the same in both Greek and Latin. Okay, and what what uh, Saint, Pope Saint Leo the Great did was he pierced beyond that idea of the mask, and our understand modern understanding of the word personality comes directly from that definition of Pope Leo the Great. Of course, the reference there was to the theater when an individual would in a, effectively put on the persona of another individual in his theatrical performance right. Comedy, or that. tragedy. A exactly. So this came then to be assigned as a reference to the human person, that right. individual personality, a person that we, we each right. are. Now there's another side of this, of, of the common theology then regarding Christ, which that needs to be considered and that is that in his humanity Christ learned many things simply through experiential knowledge as as we as we do right. ourselves he had a human intellect he had a human will he had human emotions and there
therefore he had all these constituent parts except for being a, not being a human person that we have. And then so when scripture says that Jesus grew in grace and wisdom, it referred to his human sp- experiential knowledge, right. such as learning to be a carpenter, learning to walk, and right. so on, by the example and the assistance of his parents and, 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 and all right. of these things. But when it comes to his human intellect, we have to say, do we not, that in the, the, in the intellect of Christ, he had from the moment of his, the incarnation... The human intellect. The human intellect of Christ, he had from the moment of his incarnation, the vision of the divine nature. Yes, he did. And so, therefore, he could not lack, at least potentially, in his human intellect, right. any knowledge that he wished to know Correct. at any particular Correct. moment. The, the question that is raised by some of the fathers of the church is, how much did he wish to know? He wished to know everything that he needed to know to, to, dis, to discuss uh, the divine plans he was sent to reveal. So what you could say is, unlike us who are uh, infinitely curious about everything, <laughs> Jesus did not indulge in idle mental no. curiosities no. or thoughts about that anything which was not pertinent to his, his divine mission on earth. Exactly. So he could say that the Son of Man does not know the day and the hour of his return, but of course... In, as God, he certainly did know the day and hour of his return. Right. And, and, and er, early in the church, some people said that he didn't know in his human intellect. And, but as we both know, a series of popes said, oh, yes, he did. Uh, and this was, of course, uh, by way of infused knowledge, beatific uh, knowledge, but particularly infused knowledge. What is infused knowledge? Even if it's a mystic here on earth, it is knowledge they acquire by the action of grace, not experience. So he had the sense knowledge that he acquired. Right. Uh, and and we, sh- we should point out that in human beings, our knowledge is dependent upon material organs of our nervous system, our brain, mm-hmm. our senses. So from sense knowledge, Christ could, could not acquire sense knowledge, which he was not uh, in, 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 in his body, body, in the matter of his human body, material capable of acquiring although in his intellect the intellect is present fully human the yes. human intellect is fully present at the at all of our conception but in us it's not able to uh, work integrally with our body and there so for we have no consciousness of ourselves and of our uh, of knowledge that we acquire in the womb listening to our parents play right. uh, Beethoven in the background or uh, our mother's heartbeat or right. whatever is we're acquiring that sense knowledge um, we only only begin to develop this capacity to integrate it into our person, right. which in Christ the capacity was present from the moment of the from the moment of his conception yeah. in his human intellect and could operate without a material organ because it was not dependent on the senses. Absolutely, for, for, for it was the not entirety of his knowledge by the senses. It was not limited to the senses alone, but to the beatific vision and the infused graces proceeding from his divinity right. into his human intellect very well put very well and into put. his human will for that perfect conformity to the will of the father as it says in hebrews that he he understood and he came at the moment of his human existence to sacrifice his body you have prepared a body for me and he accepted that mission from the very moment of his incarnation right. and with his will embraced the will with his human will embraced the divine will exactly uh, there's very early in the church the challenging of the knowledge of Christ uh, came to the fore and the earliest example we have of a father and doctor of the church Cyril of Alexandria to be specific uh, who was who presided at the council of uh, Ephesus at, at the specific bequest of the Holy Father he took this issue on and he states uh, that uh, the heretics of his time uh, refer to um, the Jesus statement in Matthew that uh, neither, the, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son knows the, the day of the return of Christ. Okay? Now there's a, there's a quote that I want to frame this with from the Catechism of the Catholic Church and I'm just going to read it from this paper. Okay? It's article number 474. By its union to the divine wisdom in the person of the incarnate word, Christ enjoyed in his human knowledge the fullness of understanding of the eternal plans he had come to reveal. 
Now, what he admitted to not knowing in this area, he elsewhere declared himself not sent to reveal. So the question is, did Jesus, by definition, have to know the day and the hour? Of course he did, because it was probably one of the most central facts of the divine plans that he had come to reveal, that he would return at the end of time to judge the living and the dead. Uh, the uh, the uh, reaction of St. Cyril of Jerusalem to all of this, to, to answer these heretics, was he said, well, in what way... He quotes them as saying, is in what way can he claim that, that uh, Jesus is God since he himself says he doesn't know the day or the hour? Okay? And he says this in his On the Consubstantiality, On the Holiness and Consubstantiality of the uh, Trinity. And he says, it's quite simple. Jesus himself tells us that he created this world, its time, its matter, etc. Okay? So how could it be possible that, that which he created he wouldn't know uh, when it would end. It's impossible. He also goes on to say that anybody who denies this and, and subsequently tries to deny that Jesus as God knew the day and the hour cannot avoid the charge of blasphemy. That, those are pretty strong words, but they're not mine. They're St. Cyril of well, Alexandria. And, and, of course, we're protecting the, uh, the, Trinita or the Christological dogmas that were developed with great care in the 300s, 400s, 500s, and 600s, where progressively the church ad addressed the issues of the human nature of Christ, the human personhood of Christ, and even the human will of Christ as these issues were brought up right. and people would, uh, heretics would claim, well, there was really only one will in Christ, and the church said, no, there was a human will exactly. and a divine will in, in perfect union, whole and entire in each nature, but uh, bonded together in this hypostatic union. So the church addressed these yes. issues not out of uh, a desire, a curiosity, or no. a desire to but stand to error, but to answer errors, and so define these things, and we, we're sort of forgetting them in the modern era because I think uh, a lack of real reference to these early, uh, these early doctrines, well, not just among theologians, exactly, but among the clergy and among the laity who have not really looked at this closely. Well, in a moment we're going to take a look at a quote. Uh, from Pope uh, Vigilius, okay? Because that exact uh, uh, example of the will of Christ, the, many, the wills of Christ, came out in a heresy uh, that was uh, went by the name the Agnote. And Pope Vigilius is answering them specifically. And Pope Vigilius responded to, to their heresy by saying, If anyone says that the one Jesus Christ, true Son of God and true Son of Man, was ignorant of the future things, or of the day of the last judgment, and says he would know only as much as the divinity dwelling in him, as in another mode made known to him, let him be anathema. Now, what is the point that Pope Vigilius is making? He's making the same point that has been already been made by, by uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria. You can't divide up Christ. You can't artificially divide up Christ. Well, you end up with sort of a schizophrenic cool. uh, situation where you've got God, Jesus as God on one hand, and you've got Jesus as man as the other. And, of course, the, there you end up with two persons and... Uh, uh, that just that, that doesn't work. It's like two two different beings. When there is only in Christ, there is only one. There is only one person, exactly. and that is the divine person, the second person of the word. But I think maybe another example that's uh, opportune here is. Uh, to go back to what we were saying earlier, that Jesus only knew in his human intellect what he needed to uh, to relay or to profess to us as right. a consequence of his mission. Right. Uh, Jesus could have had Einstein been alive, discuss relativity with him, and set him straight on, on points I'm sure that other mathematicians that, you know, could argue with. Absolutely. He could have discussed any subject because as God he knows all things, right. or any la spoken any language. Uh, that knowledge was available to him, but as we were saying, he wasn't about idle curiosity. He was about the mission that right. was given by the Father, and therefore he had no need of that in his human intellect, and therefore he didn't appeal to his divine knowledge in his human exactly. intellect for that information. Well, the next pope who, who handles this after Vigilius, uh, which makes it a little bit difficult to understand how moderns could be, be questioning some of these things, Pope St. Gregory the Great, one of the greatest theologians in the entire history of the Church, answered this question directly when he said that Jesus in his human intellect did know the day and the hour but he while he knew it in his human knowledge his human intellect he didn't know it 
from his human knowledge and human intellect. This was something that was revealed to him through, infu through infused knowledge from the divine, from the divine uh, nature of, of his hypostatic union. Well, I think that's sort of a killer quote, quote for our point, and uh, we'll, we'll pick up with some more thoughts on this when we return <laughs> from our break in a moment. If you would like to write to us at EWTN, we would love to hear from you. Our address is EWTN, 5817 Old Leeds Road, Irondale, Alabama, 35210. Or check out our website at www.ewtn.com. Let's return to The Last Things in Time and Eternity on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Well, welcome back to our discussion. We were talking about the human knowledge of Jesus. What did he know and when did he know it? And I, I think we succeeded in establishing that in the early church, through the, in the words of Pope Vigilius, St. Cyril, uh, Pope Gregory the Great, and others, that there, there really was a consciousness in the faith of the church that Jesus understood who he was right. from the moment of his incarnation, and he understood uh, everything which he needed to know with respect to his, uh, his uh, mission from the Father uh, right. in the redemption. Now... The situation, of course, is that today there is this forgetfulness of these truths <laughs> and uh, what has to be described as a certain amount of vain rethinking of these issues right. and proposals being uh, you know, suggested in different quarters that, well, Jesus didn't really know who he was or he didn't know until this point in his mission or that point and so on. But we actually know from uh, more recent popes yeah. that these are not matters that are really open to discussion, are they? Uh, no, they're not. Uh, we can go to two popes in the 20th century. I won't take the time to give the quote of Pius XI, but Pius XI, in his, in his exhortation on the Sacred Heart, uh, clearly goes into Christ's knowledge of all of the uh, members of the uh, mystical body of Christ from the t moment of the Incarnation on. And Pope Pius XII responding to these, these, this resurgence of modern speculations about whether Jesus really knew uh, stated that the problem with all of these types of, uh, uh, that type of theologian, all theologians aren't like that, or uh, uh, scholastics, is that they for, they're trying to treat the humanity of Jesus as if somehow it didn't uh, exist in, in the full divine person of Christ. Well, and of course, this is a general issue in theology, I think, when you sort of compare. Well, theology has gotten very specialized, yeah. and uh, as one of my profs at the Angelicum you know, said that... Uh, you know, you'll have a, a scholar whose specialty is Ephesians 3.7. If you ask him about 3.8 or 3.6, you know, you're, you're out of luck. And, That's I, think, right. and I, I think there's a little of that here. And whereas uh, the great theologians and the fathers and doctors were very, uh, they had a very synthetic view of all of theology. Yeah. They really saw the total tapestry. Uh, it was of, systematic. Of, uh, systematic. Uh, and indeed, Cardinal Ratzinger ha has made the point as well that when we study these issues, especially if we're doing it out of sacred scripture, yes. it must be done according to the analogy of faith. Yes. And not just the historical critical method or other methods which have their place for certain kinds of information, right. but they cannot give you the total picture of what the faith knows and believes. Exactly. There are certain things we learn from the word Qua the word that may not be challenged by historical studies. We either accept them on faith or we don't. Right, and this has been a, a modern concern, I think, yeah. of of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and Absolutely. of the Popes to to point this out that the the faith is communicated to us. We do not derive it from our from our studies. Right. Now, in 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 the 1940s, Pope Pius the Twelfth was facing this modern issue, and basic which dealt with, okay, if Jesus knew, how did he know? And he directly addresses both of these questions. Uh, this is one quote. 
he says, For hardly was he, Jesus, conceived in the womb of the mother of God when he began to enjoy the beatific vision. And in that vision, all the members of his mystical body, note, all, not just now, all in the entire history of the world, members of his mystical body were continually and unceasingly present to him. And he embraced them with all his redeeming love. He knew from the moment of the incarnation, Colin and Desmond and everybody else in this studio and everybody in the world or in any century. Well, and I think the census fidelium is so clear on this because what Catholic in contemplating the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary has not considered that there in the agony in the garden Jesus saw our, our, our okay. sins as well as our, as our virtues culpa. and that he agonized over each one of us. Otherwise, the redemption is sort of this generalized thing and it's not just for me. Whereas the uh, the church asserts that had there been only one sinner, Jesus would have become incarnate and, and re died simply to redeem that one person. As a matter of fact, you just redacted that, that exhortation of Pius XI. <laughs> well, Beautifully, I might add. Okay, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jesus also uh, possessed, beyond the knowledge he would have gotten through knowing every member of the mystical body up till the end of time, and if he knows every, every member of the mystical body till the end of time, he obviously has to know when, it, when that time is going to end. Jesus also possessed infused knowledge during his earthly mission. Infused knowledge is that which comes to us by grace. And, of course, he possessed infused knowledge at a level no other, no other person, no other human being ever had, because he was a divine person. Well... Just an interesting aside that's occurred to me on many occasions, and that is we have in the history of the saints uh, children who are mystics by the age of four, Certainly. five, and six. And there's knowledge. Who would doubt that our Lord and Our Lady, for instance, would not be receiving those in fruit fused graces <laughs> even earlier? Yeah. Yet, indeed, there are the doubters. So, yeah, well, they would, like the poor, they shall always be with us, right? <laughs> yes, I suppose so. Okay, the next quote from Pius the Twelfth is he says it is besides the symbol of that burning love which infused into his soul enriches the human will of christ and enlightens and governs its acts by the most perfect knowledge derived both from the beatific vision and that which is directly infused let me repeat that the most perfect knowledge derived from there's no caveats in there mm -hmm. Not as far as what relates to his mission. And, 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 of course, this is simply an ancillary teaching to the fact that there cannot be any uh, imperfection in Christ. Right. And, of course, certainly St. Thomas Aquinas uh, sees anything which is short of perfection as being either uh, uh, inculpable moral per imperfection right. or culpable moral perfection which goes by the name of venial sin well, as a matter and of there fact, can't be anything of, of moral or intellectual error in Christ right. in, in that last quote I gave you Pius XII specifically cites part 3 of the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas Aquinas so in reality the church's teaching scripture, tradition, the fathers, the doctors all of it is, is very consistent and has a synthetic view of the mystery of Christ and also of the consequences which over time the church in her contemplation of that mystery has derived from the, the basic facts of scripture Absolutely. and tradition Absolutely. and has developed it in quite clear ways which I think uh, there has been a certain amount of forgetfulness. Now as this relates then, we're, we started out dealing with the importance of this because if we want to know what is the authority of the church's teaching on the eschaton will ultimately fall back on the authority of Christ's words absolutely and the authority of what he said regarding the end times that time leading up to uh, the eschaton at the end of history absolutely it's basically that ties also in with another point none of the modern challenges to the knowledge of Christ are really introducing anything really new it's as as uh, as Father Jurgens once said, I've never seen any heresy which truly died. It's always, he was the great, the great uh, patristic scholar. He said, they always resurrect in some, in some new form under a new name, but they never completely stay dead. They just keep repeating themselves throughout history. And those who don't know the history of the church's mm -hmm. teachings will not recognize that repeat. And, of course, there may or may not be. We're not talking about the, the, the moral guilt of any. Oh, no, ignorance. no, not at all. We're talking about, uh, I think that knowledge in theology is elsewhere has, has advanced you know, so much uh, in, in modern times, both in the number of people dealing 
dealing with the subject and well as the uh, the uh, the depth that has gone uh, come about as a result of this specialization that you don't find many St. Thomas Aquinas's anymore no. who have this broad breadth of understanding of theology that goes with it a sufficient depth to reconcile these kinds of issues which the mind thinks of if it thinks about you know about Christ in any depth whatsoever these issues will come to mind and then you don't have the solution because you don't have this broad depth of knowledge that answers these holes uh, that seem to be occurring right. in the church's teaching. Well, they don't really occur, but they seem to be occurring. Most of these lacuna can be solved if they will follow the advice of Pope John Paul II. He says, let us return to the fathers. And by returning to the fathers and their contemplation of scripture and the unwritten tradition, you really can not know everything as our Lord did, right. but uh, know everything that we need to know. Everything essential. Everything essential. Well, on that note, I think we'll, <laughs> we're able to end this episode, and we hope that we brought Colin. some enlightenment into the intellects of our, of our viewers and listeners as well. Join us next time for The Last Things in Time and Eternity on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. It's fun. It's free. It's Wings, EWTN's weekly e-newsletter delivered to your inbox free each week. Read about upcoming special programming. And learn what's new at EWTN, radio, TV, and Internet. Just send an email to radio at EWTN.com. Be sure to put Wings in the subject line. Wings, a free service from your friends at the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. Pray with us, the Holy Rosary, daily on the Global Catholic Network, EWTN.